Times bestselling author and speaker. And this is why you should not ever even log on or watch The Reverend and the Reverend. Mm. So you mentioned uh, a little bit ago about serving serving the season that you're in. And you mentioned that with you and your wife that during COVID, you've been able to help people and some of those things. But um, what what does that look, what does this look like for you specifically? You know, th- this well, season. It, uh, you must have been spying on me. Let me tell you what I've been dealing with during COVID. <laughs> We've not only had COVID, we've had one of us had a serious health crisis. I don't want to go any further into that, but we've had months and months and months of therapy. Um, then both our sons, both our idiot sons, uh, I have a son and a stepson, uh, decided to get married within two weeks of each other. Congratulations, this, by the during way. During this period. Thank you very much. We're, thr- <laughs> no, we're thrilled. And I'm having fun picking on them. Uh, but still, that was quite a bit. In addition to that, you're, you're going you're gonna to weep over this one. We've got two homes, one in D.C. and Nashville. I think you probably know that because of what I do in D.C. And both of them flooded during this time. Oh, Both of no. them got doused by broken pipes of some kind. And we've had to have both of them rebuilt during this period. So since May, uh, we have had layer on top of layer on top of layer. But the good news is, thank God, first of all, for insurance. But the other thing, the good news is that my wife just looked at each other and go, all right. I love you. You love me. God's with us. This is the season that we, I don't know why it's happened. I'm not telling you I'm happy about it. I'm not sitting here going, praise the Lord. My house got doused and I, her personal property was destroyed. But I am saying, all right, this was ordained for me. God knew it was coming. I'm prepared for it. Uh, we must go through many difficulties to enter the kingdom. Uh, I'm, I'm going to own this thing. And we're just about to get out of it. We're going to be out of it here in about six weeks. Uh, but I'm telling you that this has been a season that I've had to just say, I'm going to be a good man. I'm going to walk through this thing. I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to love my wife well. I'm going to be a better man on the other side. And uh, we're going to own this thing. And that's, I think that's the, that is a godly response. I haven't done it perfectly. And I've had my days of saying, saying Lord, I sure have better things to do with my time than sit around and talk to contractors about drywall. But still, uh, that's where we are. And that's how we've handled it. So you want to know how it looks for me. Everything I've just said, I'm living to the nth degree in 2020. It's been the most unusual year of my life. And yet I'll have to say that I'm pretty much moving from victory to victory, tough as it's been, uh, because of the grace of God and these basic attitudes that I've been taught through my life by other good men. That's that's pretty incredible. And I I have to say that your sons must have a little something smart going on with them because I also got married during the pandemic. And, uh, hey. and thus far, seven months in, it's it's working out pretty well. So, you know, there there is something to be said for uh, for having a partner during isolation. So we'll we'll leave it at that um, Great. with uh, with so many of the the things going on. If we can shift, you talked about you've got a house in Nashville. Um, I know your your wife, Bev, is is incredibly involved in songwriting and those kind of things is very talented in her own regard. And yes. uh, and you also have a home right outside of D.C. You do a lot of work in the political sphere, which I I will have to say is one of the things that attracted me the most to your podcast is as a Christian and you do tend to be um, just to the right of center. Uh, there are just a couple of issues that sort of push you in that direction. You you really do tend to take a very neutral position when we're having a conversation about good men, about noble men, and then we look at the options that we've been given mm. for the top leadership in our country. Um, it's hard to identify all of these, you know, these seven fires that you said and where they actually line up in their lives. We've been put now in a position where um, the the news media and the things that the presidents or the the let's say presidential candidates, we'll put it that way, are saying tend to be really opposed to one another. We've entered into a huge time of unrest. Um, what do you see happening? Let's just say in the next you know, three to three to six weeks. Do you think that we'll actually have a declared president elect? Do you think that this will carry into the beginning of 2021? What do you see as a, um, a, a brilliant political mind that we don't sitting here in Dallas, Texas? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, there's an introduction to it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I think that we will see this season of challenges and lawsuits dissipate within the next couple of weeks. And I would guess in the first couple of weeks of December, Um, that Donald Trump will concede, um, that we will have, of course, I believe it's December the 11th that the official certification was scheduled to take place anyway. You have, I think, you know, you have elections and then the election has to be certified and that happens about five to six weeks after the election. So I believe it's December 11th that the election exactly certified, um, that the electoral college finalizes its vote, all of that kind of thing. 
And so I expect, um, I certainly don't blame Donald Trump in these tight races for filing a lawsuit. I, I don't think any major corruption has been found. Uh, I've asked my pollster friends and recent investigator friends in D.C. They can't. T- some of them can't tell me everything that they know, but they've said no major corruption's been found. Um, so you know, there's a little edge of corruption in every presidential election. I've always loved what William Buckley said. He said, "My grandfather died in 1919, but he had such a strong sense of civic duty that he voted for Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1936." <laughs> and so that's you know, there's always throughout history been a you, know, you don't know that the guy in the small town who's running the polls isn't you know slanting the vote a little bit or whatever there's always that thing that's possible but today with the monitors and the lawyers for both parties and the fbi even and uh, people of different parties watching each other at the polls even though they get along great uh, i think there's been very very little corruption frankly that's not me picking on donald trump so i think we're going to see the lawsuits wash through uh unless something shocking happens um, there have already there been a little bit of, there's been a little bit of corruption on, on earth, but it's not enough to change even one state uh, or even a county yet. Uh, and this is I got to tell you, as a guy who's been a student of elections and a, a historian, this is this is normal. You, you always have people later who say, hey, there's a like in one of Lyndon Johnson's uh, elections, um, an entire ballot box was found late and every vote in it was for Lyndon Johnson. Well, that sounds like some corruption to me, but you know, he went on to the Senate and became president, vice president. So all of that to say, um, I think we'll see it all washed through in the next couple of weeks. I don't think it's gonna surface anything huge. And I think the first couple of weeks of December, we'll see certification and we'll, we'll start moving forward. That doesn't mean Trump's gonna be happy about it. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean the Trump and Biden are gonna get along. You're gonna see smiley faces over a beer or whatever. But I do think that you're going to see um, a, a, a transition that ends up with Joe Biden being inaugurated on January 20th. What do I think is going to happen with Trump? I think he's going to step out. I think he's going to be loyal opposition, not loyal opposition, but but fiery opposition. I think he's going to continue to define the GOP. Um, and I think it's very possible he's going to run again in 2024. I think it's very possible. He's already talking about it. Yeah, we, we that actually, today. yeah, that was going to be one of our, our follow-up questions about that. I know uh, uh, I'd seen comments earlier this week from Lindsey Graham that said that he might actually support a 2024 bid by Donald Trump. Um, with with that in particular, you know, you, you did write a book called Choosing Donald Trump that's specifically about the way that uh, a lot of the, I guess, sort of religious pundits um, backed Donald Trump, which otherwise would have seemed just completely ridiculous. Uh, why do you think that that a lot of the people that were, you know, quote unquote, God fearing or religious leaders, and now in the post 2020 election, we see that the largest amount of blue collar workers and the largest demographic of, of black people in particular voted for Donald Trump more than they have any other Republican candidate. Why do you think it is he's become so polarizing in these areas? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, part of the problem is that Donald Trump is his own worst enemy. He's actually done some pretty amazing things for minorities. Um, For example, I, I, as you, since you listen to my podcast, you already know, uh, I work very closely with the African American community. I go to a largely African American church. I've got about a half a dozen African Americans in my family. Uh, I've guest lectured in African American history at places like Tuskegee and so on. And, and I care very much about that part of the world. So, for example, Donald Trump's done more for historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, than any other president of recent, recent memory. Um, also, I want to move. We should move as a nation away from identity politics. But but the idea that a man improves the economy means all ships rise. Uh, you know, rising tide lifts all ships. And so he's 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 done a huge amount for African Americans. Done a huge amount for Hispanic community. Uh, done a huge amount for whites. Why? Because he has, in fact, or either he's inherited or he's engineered uh, an improved economy, cut taxes, uh, limited foreign uh, you know, control of our economy, things like that. So he's done a lot of good things. The problem with Donald Trump is that he is louder than his message, his manner, him, mm-hmm. his bombast, his tweeting, his language, his cussing, his relationship with strippers, his insults. It's it shouts louder than the good things he's done. And I asked some people in D.C., why didn't you run a commercial where, you know, it, would, it was just basically saying, listen to what Donald Trump's done. Like have Tom Selleck get up on television and say, what has Donald Trump done for us? And start to list seven or eight things that he's done that would shock people. Like, for example, that he was maybe the best president for historically black colleges and universities in several generations. Um, so the problem is that Donald Trump is the shiny object that's distracting everybody from the actual core message. 
And so that's the problem. He, he's, he's harsh. He's bombastic. He's rude. Uh, people quickly uh, hate him. Even those who support him have to hold the nose to do it. And so, that, so that's what happened in, in this election. The, the benefit he was to society was not the main thing known. I bet, I bet you did not see one television commercial that said that Donald Trump did the following things for America. Instead, it was Donald Trump attacking. It was an attack ad. And yeah. it just didn't work.